Lord, you have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping with your statutes. Amen. Please don't hear what I am not saying. The sermon I was about to deliver was on a difficult, albeit important, subject. And I knew that there would be people who would hear my words, but not necessarily listen to anything I was actually saying. You know, we all have times when we practice selective hearing. I recall going with my parents to a doctor's appointment where my father was diagnosed with cancer. And as I was listening to the doctor intently, I soon realized my parents were not hearing what he was saying. And that happens. And knowing that, I carefully made my way through the text and its application for the situation at hand. And still afterward, there were people who came up with a whole host of quotes from my sermon of things I never said. Fortunately, most people who had listened to what I said corrected the misunderstanding of those people, and we were able to deal with the matter in a healthy way. Some people fall prey to hearing words without listening to what is really being said. While we may try to listen too often, we tend to hear only what we want to hear. Likewise, we've heard things that have been attributed to the Word of God that are not found in Scripture. Someone says something that sounds like sacred text, declares that it's found somewhere in the Bible, and people just nod their heads and go along with it. The problem is these words are not in the Bible. And while some of these sayings may be sort of true or close enough for people, there are other sayings that are just plain wrong. For instance, we have heard it said that God will help those who help themselves. Now people may mean well when they say this, but meeting God halfway, doing your part so he'll do the rest, is not what the Bible teaches. Sure, there are things that we are called to do as Christians, but we don't do them out of our own strength and effort. In fact, the Bible actually teaches quite the opposite. God helps those who cannot help themselves. We cannot save ourselves. It's not a 50-50 effort. It's not 60-40, not 70-30, not even 95-5. Salvation is totally beyond our ability. It's all by grace that we've been saved, by God. Only God can do that. Our strength is also from the Lord. When we're at our wit's end, when our strength fails, when we can't take another step, that's when we know God helps those who cannot help themselves. And he does that in Jesus. Or how about money is the root of all evil? It's just a couple of words off. But those couple of words make a tremendous difference. 1 Timothy 6.10, Paul tells young pastor Timothy, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Paul doesn't say that money is evil. He says the love of money can be a root of all kinds of evil. It's not the root of every problem in society or every sin in our hearts. But the love of money is powerful. And it can be a real problem. The statement is close, but not close enough. Now here's one more. God moves in mysterious ways. Now when you hear that, what do you think? For someone who lives outside of the faith, it sounds trite and insincere. Some people think that it shows a lack of personal responsibility. The failures, the mistakes, disappointments belong to you. They are not the work of some higher power. Oftentimes, it's offered as an answer to a situation when a person is simply stumped for an answer. It's sort of like a shallow believer's fallback position. But these words are not found in the scriptures. They come from a hymn. 
What the Bible does say is, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, we don't need to understand everything about God and his ways. We do not need to know the whys of everything he does. We just need to know him. To know his power to make things happen. To know his love for us and his concern for our salvation demonstrated at the cross. So hear what I am saying. There are times when people choose to believe things that people attribute to God when his word doesn't say what they say it says. And that was part of the spiritual plague that engulfed Judea in 30 AD. Believe, people believed what the religious type said God said rather than know the word of God for themselves. And while the scriptures may have been quoted, it was the interpretations of the religious types that were being taught as truth. Now in the days of Jesus, there were two primary rabbinical schools of thought. The school of Rabbi Shammai and the school of Rabbi Hillel. The school of Shammai believed in the strict interpretation of the Mosaic law codes as they are contained in the first five books of the Bible, which we sometimes call the Pentateuch. These rabbis applied every word as being Israel-centric. That is, God only loved Israel, had no desire or concern for the Gentile nations. And their idea of how believers were to live focused on following the temple rituals. Nothing else mattered. The school of Hillel was less strict, considered even liberal, as they applied God's word to the lives of individuals. The laws of Moses were treated more like suggestions rather than hard and fast rules. The rabbis of Hillel weren't concerned about the temple rituals as much as they were about people getting along, of toleration, even of the Gentiles. Now these conflicting schools of interpretation with their less than faithful teachings are what Jesus is addressing in this morning's gospel reading. So let's turn back now to God's word and see what Jesus says. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Let's stop there. Now, as we heard last week from the gospel lesson, Jesus came to fulfill God's law on our behalf, not to abolish it. Here, the Lord shows how the religious types didn't know as much as they thought they did. And even the Lutheran fathers observe in the confessions, Christ takes the law into his hands and explains it spiritually. Having affirmed the abiding authority of God's law previously, Jesus today makes his own pronouncements and application of God's law, teaching it as the deeper spiritual standard of God's kingdom. You have heard it said, but I say to you. Notice Jesus addresses what was said to those of old, not what had been written. Jesus was confronting the interpretation of God's word, not the word itself. The religious types reasoned that as long as you didn't actually murder someone, then you had not broken God's law. But we see in the Old Testament God had much more in mind when, for instance, we read from the book of Proverbs chapter 6, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feasts that make haste to run to evil, a false witness that breathes out lies, 
and one who sows discord among brothers. The religious types focused on the civil law applied to a crime that made a person liable to judgment. This is all that they addressed. Nothing about God, nothing about what he requires in a person's heart. Not a word about the thoughts and the passions that can lead up to the act of murder. Nothing of the evil inclinations that of themselves need to be addressed and dealt with. In fact, Jesus would later speak to this in Matthew 15 and would say, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. So I say to you is the opposite of what you have heard. And what the disciples now hear from Jesus is vastly different from what the religious types have been saying. Again, Jesus is not disputing what God says. He disputes what the scribes say God meant by what he had said. Jesus expounds on the Mosaic teaching of you shall not murder, not limiting it to civil realm. He goes to the heart of the matter. Murder proceeds from anger and hate and a disparaging attitude toward others. In 1 John chapter 3, we hear what the Lord is getting at when the Apostle John writes, Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Jesus doesn't focus on the matter of the appropriate punishment for sins. He focuses on God's desire for how people are to live in his kingdom. And picking up at verse 23, we see Jesus tell his disciples how things are supposed to work in the kingdom. He says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave the gift before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. You see, what is important to God is stated. First, be reconciled. That is what is all important to God. What God desires of us, he works in us through his grace. Just as St. Paul taught the Corinthians saying, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God's law is given to us in life and good, as we hear from this morning's Old Testament reading, where we're told, therefore, choose life, that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, <coughs> obeying his voice, and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers. Grace, through the, through the grace of God, made manifest in the life, sacrifice, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the Lord shows us his kingdom in terms of understanding that the depth of our sin is met by the breadth of his mercy. Jesus goes on, you have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You see, just as murder is preceded by evil thoughts and by evil inclinations toward another person. So is adultery, and divorce, and lying, and stealing, false witness, and so forth. See, it doesn't matter what we may have been told. It matters what God has actually said. The word of God's law goes deep into our heart and soul and mind, convicting us of our sinful thoughts and evil inclinations. But 
thankfully, that same word that became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth also speaks on our behalf and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The kingdom of God is marked by a deep conviction of our sin, but God's people are also comforted by the deeper reach of his mercy. In the kingdom, God calls out our sin, but he also speaks to our salvation through Jesus, who is the righteousness of God who's been manifested apart from the law through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And so may God send his spirit among us that we believe what he has said, not what others say he said, all to the hope and peace that he intends for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all human understanding keep and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.